Want to advertise your business in a cost-effective way? It's time to give podcast advertising a try. Research shows a high rate of podcast listeners made a purchase as a result of an ad they heard on a podcast. Visit podbean.com slash brands to launch a cost-effective podcast advertising campaign in minutes. That's P-O-D-B-E-A-N dot com slash brands. Hello and welcome to episode 87 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my live stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. Now, with Paul and his band heading out on their latest tour in a matter of days, it's a real delight to be joined by one of the current lineup. Singer songwriter, musician, and keys player in the Paul Weller band, Tom Van Heel. Tom's entry into the crew is one of my favourite stories yet. What a magical experience he's had so far. We chat Saturn's pattern through to Fat Pop, live in the UK, Europe, the US, and down under. A real insider's view. Let's get into it. Tom Van Heel, thanks for joining me. My pleasure, Dan. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm really excited about having you on, not least because we're just around the corner now from the next tour, right? Yeah, not long. We start on Monday. Rehearsals on Monday. I can't wait. My bags are packed. They are by the door. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Looking forward to it. How long do you stay away from home for rehearsals? How long is rehearsal period? It depends, really. I think this time it's about two weeks. We did a long rehearsal last time because of the COVID and we had a massive break and stuff. Yeah, normally it's about one to two weeks. And then we do a bit of production rehearsal. So we go to like this big sort of hangout, do a full production for like two or three days. But yeah, so it's, it's sort of get in and know your bits and, uh, and crack on, really. And how confident are you feeling about that right now? So what have you been given? A list of songs to learn or what? Yeah, uh, we've got about... Uh, we had about 40 songs I think this time which obviously gets whittled down to about 30 I think old and new ones the set's really great actually it looks really good this time I'm really excited to to do it to get going I bet I bet well look we'll dig into all of this as we go through this conversation I'm I'm really excited about having you on obviously and let's kick things off to talk about when it was that you first discovered the music of PW of Paul Weller well I'm from Woking Uh, I don't know if you know that so it was kind of he's like the the town hero really (laughs) he's a a god in Woking right (laughs) yeah he is I didn't really know about him until I think I was about 15 and I went to Guildfest which is a festival in Guildford and he was playing and um and I didn't know who he was. I was like, wow, who's that man? The person that I was with he was like, that's Paul Weller. And I had no idea. And I was like, oh my God, wow. And I loved it. And uh, and then after that, I sort of re- realised he was from Woking and delved deeper into kind of who he was and the jam. And, and I just fell in love with it. And my parents were like, well, what do you mean you don't know who he is? <laughs> you know? And so they sort of they sort of showed me this kind of back catalogue. And I was like, wow, why have you never told me about this? Yeah, I just became a massive fan, really. And my dad, a French polisher, met Paul's cousin, who's a, a painter. And this is when I first kind of got into music and I was really into Paul and stuff. And and he sort of overheard him having a conversation. He was like, you know, my son's really into Paul Weller, blah, blah, blah. And he became like a family friend. And uh, he used to come around and, and teach me guitar and stuff. And that was kind of how I um, how I got down the barn, really. Because my mum would always say to me, she's like, well, just ring up the barn and, you know, just go down and try and do a bit of work experience for years. And I was like, no, you can't do that. You can't just ring up, you know, Paul's studio and go down and just knock on the door. But... Evidently, you can. <laughs> so I sort of went down and, and I spoke to Charles, who's the engineer down there. And I could hear him sort of going, yeah, yeah. And he was joking him just about to put the phone down. I was like, well, I know Mark. And he went, what? I was like, yeah, I know, I know, uh, I know Paul's cousin Mark. He was like, oh, uh, OK then. And I sort of lied a bit and I said, I really want to know how to use Pro Tools and how to get into the recording side of it, of, of which I didn't. And he now knows that. <laughs> oh, chatting up the engineer, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, can you teach me how to do that? But, so I ended up going down. I met Paul on the first day I was there, actually. And he sort of came out, he had no top on. And I was like, Jesus Christ, Paul. And it walked in, you know, majestic. And, um, and I was sort of calling up cables and filling up the skip and uh, just making tea. And they were having this new... Um, <laughs> they have this new soundproof input above the, the desk. It was like this massive, huge bit of soundproofing. Charles was like, can you just get up on this ladder and just hold this soundproof? It was like day one, you know, and I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, don't drop it, you know? So yeah, I remember going in, going into the office 
with Charles and there was just Paul and I think I can't remember who it was actually with him maybe Claire and I think Paul was signing some stuff and he was like who's this, this new tea boy then and it shook my hand and that's how I met him I think I was about 21 when I first went down there what period of this this would have been what 2010 something like that I guess so. I'm 32 now so what's that so I don't know yeah but it was um it was amazing I was just I was I felt really lucky to be able to be there around all this stuff that was happening and Steve Pilgrim came down that week to record an album and I was just sort of knocking around and I wouldn't go home until sort of like one in the morning and I would just make tea for him and <laughs> and I ended up playing on playing piano on one of these tracks he did but I don't think it came out yet but I was like wow I came home I was buzzing you know I was like mum you're, never, you're not going to believe what happened you know and it was great and then Paul said to me he was like what are you doing at the weekend and I was like well nothing you know come to this art exhibition because Peter Blake was putting on this uh sort of exhibition of Paul's stuff, the light box in Woking. I was like, okay, so I went down there and um, and he said, well, what are you doing next week? And I was like, well, nothing again, you know. It's just sort of like a 21-year-old that didn't know what I was doing. And uh, he said, well, I've got this, uh, my keyboard player's band, The Moons Are In. Why don't you come down and just hang about and, you know, do what you're doing? I was like, okay. So I went down and, and met the guys and I was just sort of like, I've got to kind of get in here somehow. I didn't really know how, but I was sort of playing the odd thing or whatever. And then Ben Gordelia who's Paul's percussionist now, is also the drummer in the moons. He overheard me playing the piano. And he was like, oh, you're a keys player. And I was like, well, no, not really, but I can sort of do this. And he said, oh, we need a keys player. I was like, oh, go, go, go and show Andy. And I was like, nah. And so I didn't, I left it. And then uh, Ben had a word with Andy and said, look, you know, this little young person that doesn't go away can play the keyboards. <laughs> so I ended up just jamming with them. We were just, I remember just really late nights, we would just play music all the time. And I would jam away. And then by the end of this week, I was sort of in the band. This is literally one of my favourite stories on the podcast so far. This is like, <laughs> unbelievable, oh, man. <laughs> I know. I couldn't believe it because it was all that time of sort of my mum going, look, go down there and just make some tea. And I thought, mum, you cannot just go down to Paul Weller's studio and make tea. But you can. And within, yeah, within sort of two weeks, I was in the moons. And then after that, they had a tour with BDI, which was Liam's band after Oasis. And they were like, do you fancy coming to, to Europe to do, to do this tour on keys? I was like, well, I'm not a keys player, but yes, I'm in. <laughs> so they sent me, I think they gave me all their albums that they had at the time. And I just sort of tried to learn them all the best I could. And I went to Andy's flat at the time and he sort of showed me a few bits. And then that was it. And I sort of don't... I think we did one gig before that tour. I think it was the Horn in St Albans and um, did that gig. And then the next gig was Munich. So that was like my first proper kind of tour in a van with the lads, you know? So it was great. Yeah. And then after that, I just sort of, I wasn't just the tea boy anymore. I was sort of, I didn't feel like this person that was kind of standing in the corner like, does anybody want some tea? I was kind of a little bit allowed in, you know? That's unbelievable. Wow. But when you say you like, you didn't think you were in, considered yourself a keys player what did you consider yourself what was your instrument of choice generally I was a drummer to start off with I sort of went to college in Guildford and did drums and I was just I just classed myself as a drummer but I could sort of play a bit of piano because my auntie's boyfriend years and years ago, when I was like five she went out with this jazz musician and he would sort of teach me a little bit of boogie woogie and stuff like that so I was always I used to look up to him and think wow you know that's really cool so I sort of knew a little bit and I would write stuff on the piano but I would never sort of class myself as a keys player you know and then I sort of played guitar as well so I think drums and guitar would be like my instruments but now it's yeah now it would be keys I guess definitely was not a keys player <laughs> when I when I joined the moons but it was great and thank god I did you know because it's sort of given me a, a livelihood now yeah that's unbelievable wow and I think I'm right in saying the first Weller track you performed on you play drums so on Saturn's Pattern yeah. was, it, was it long time on Saturn's Pattern yeah long time yeah that was great actually that was such a random thing because he just had this idea which is that so it, I don't think it got changed that much I think we played it sort of start to finish I think Bill Wheeler Kenny's son was on guitar Paul was on guitar I was on drums I can't remember who was on bass just I think a, Charles Reese is on bass on that one yeah but he might be right but he also plays <laughs> Do you remember those whiskey things you get? You put in your coffee. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Those little things you spin round. He's like, I've got this idea, and I remember him having this guitar, and it was going. <laughs> so I remember him doing that, and I was like, "What? This is far out, man." But yeah, he Paul just had these chords, and was like, "What? Can you just come play some drums on this thing?" And we played the song start to finish, and that was that, and that, that became long time, yeah. And at that point, you also had your own band, Monrose, isn't it? Yeah, I had Monrose, and we did an album which Paul really liked, actually. He tried to get us, a, he, took us he took the CD up to Rough Trade, and uh, whether they listened to it, or, I don't know, but he sort of said, come and meet us in London, and we'll, we'll take it into Rough Trade. And I was like, wow. So I said to my drummer, Jack, at the time, I was like, look, 
mate. I said, it's going to happen. I said, we're going up to London with Paul. He's going to give our CD to Rough Trade. We're going to get a record deal. Quit your job. It's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Which it didn't, unfortunately. But it was a good album. We put the album out eventually. And yeah, that was that. I think because I got the Paul gig towards the end of that band and we went out to Italy to sort of try and do the next album. But it all kind of fell apart, really. The drummer went home and the guitarist left and it was one of them. So I ended up starting Higher Peaks with um, Enrico Berto, who was the bass player of Monroe's. And he's got this beautiful studio in Italy. And we just ended up making... They, everybody went home, basically. We just made... I think we made like 11 tracks in like a week so we were just really inspired and that became Higher Peaks which was still you know still we haven't done a lot in a couple of years because I haven't been out to see him because of the Covid thing but that's still going I'm still doing that At which point did you kind of consider yourself so you mentioned the moons at which point did you consider yourself part of Paul's band and part of that unit so obviously you've done a track on Saturn's Pattern but you weren't part of the live crew at that point were you? No not at all no I would just knock about I would just be if I wasn't doing anything I would ring Charles and be like can I come down whenever it was. And he'd say, yeah, yeah, come down. And Paul would either be there or he wouldn't be there. And sometimes I would, you know, he might do some demos or stuff and I might play on a bit of that. Yeah, I definitely didn't consider myself as part of the band, but I sort of considered myself as part of the little kind of family that they have down there. I didn't feel like a stranger as much anymore. But I can see, yeah, I remember getting the call from Paul. I was My parents moved out to Spain like six years. They've moved back now. But when they were out there and I was like, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm not doing what I'm going to do, blah, blah, blah. I don't have any money. And my dad was like, look, he goes, you've got until whenever, I think June, whatever it was. He goes, because you've got to get a job or whatever you're going to do. I was like, shit, I know. And I was so close to like, I was like, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to open a beach bar. This, I'm going to move out to Spain. I'm going to open a beach bar. And that'll be that, you know. And then my dad was like, what, who is this? What is he doing? Got on the plane and I landed and I turned my phone back on and a text came through and it was from Paul. And it was like, all right, Tom, are you up for playing some keys on this tour coming up in February? And I was like, yes. I was like, what are the chances, you know? Wow. <laughs> I've kind of wait, I've waited this long. And I was like, it was always the kind of my end games. Like, I wonder if I can just sort of, if I hang around long enough, you know, <laughs> I, might, I might get the call. And I did. And I didn't know if it was, I thought it was just going to be for like that tour, really. That's kind of how he worded it in the message. Yeah, I was buzzing. I couldn't believe it. I got off the flight and I rung my parents. And I was like, well, you can stick your beach bar up your ass. You know, I'm doing this. <laughs> yeah. So that that was how I, how I joined Paul's band. And then obviously, then you get sent a list of songs and you get the emails sent through and it all becomes a bit real and you're like wow okay I've got to lock myself away for about a month now yeah this is work this, this is actual work right yeah <laughs> yeah yeah definitely but it was great you know and it really taught me how to focus on being a proper musician because before I would kind of I did stuff with From the Jam and with Bruce and, and things like that but they were like jam songs that every, I kind of knew inside out they were sort of like within me and I didn't it didn't take that long to learn them but with the Paul stuff some of it's so intricate and difficult and there's weird chord changes and there's like jazzy things I think it took me to a whole another level of playing and I don't think I would have done it unless I had to do it do you know what I mean I think I would have been lazy and not taught myself those different ways of playing and different styles of music. But because I was presented with like 70 songs, I think it was at the time, I learned loads. And I remember <laughs> I remember all the cheat sheets I had with all the chords written out. And in my, my old flat at the time, I, I, had a, I had a trail of these sheets. Right? They went from like this, the kitchen all the way. I made them go through the bedrooms, in the bathroom, right <laughs> around to my bedroom. And I said, Andy, a video. And I was like, get on this, man. I was like, how am I going to remember all this? I think, am I right in saying your first gig with PW was, was Jules Holland? Would it have been the latest show? No, my first gig was, we did a gig in Union Chapel. Oh, wow, nice. I think Richard Hawley was there and Corinne Bailey Wright, and we did an acoustic thing in Union Chapel. After that, we did the 229 Club and then the Royal Albert Hall. Wow. They were my first few gigs. And I think Jules was late. Yeah, it was later than that. And that tour was, so that was this around the Kind Revolution time, isn't it? And you're all over the place. Yeah. I mean, it's the UK, USA, Canada, Japan, Australia, which Paul doesn't visit very often, really, does it? That must have been no. incredible for a young man to suddenly be on the road going to those places. Yeah, it was like, the, it was the golden ticket. I'd never been to America and to have gone to America in that way was like, <laughs> a dream come true you know I remember sort of being on the bus because we flew to New York was the first place we went being on the bus and going over the bridge and seeing New York and I was like that was a real pinch myself moment I was just standing there with Craddock looking out the window and I was like with Steve Craddock on a tour bus looking over at New York 
what's going on? You know, we had a day off the first day we got there. And I remember all the boys blessed them. So like, oh, they knew I'd never been there. We did basically the whole of New York in an afternoon, you know, we're like, right, we need to do this. We need to go there. We need Times Square, we need to do the John Lennon thing. We need to come back. <laughs> do, 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 do. So it was amazing. And um, yeah, I loved America. And I hope we, I hope we get to go back. I remember um, seeing a picture of you at um, Hitsville on Instagram, which is one of the places yeah. they always kind of go and, and check in at, right? Yeah. What a mad experience that was. Because the thing is, when you're touring, you kind of forget where you are. You're sort of on the bus and, and especially in America, we sort of live on the bus. So you just go from venue to venue and you don't really take much notice really of what town or city you're in. And I remember one morning I woke up and, and Craddock was like, right, we're going to Motown. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, it's only around the corner. And we like parked up at the venue. And he's like, come on, we're going now, get dressed, we're going. I was like, no way. He's like, got my clothes on, got in a cab. And within five minutes, I was standing outside Hitsville, you know. And I was like, no way, man. And yeah, we went in the in the studio and had the tour. And it was it was... It was incredible, you know, and we managed to sneak off because they sort of they take you around in like a group of people, and uh, it's like this is where little Stevie Wonder used to buy his chocolate bars, you know, all this kind of stuff. And we're like, yeah, but can we just go in the studio? Can you just show us the studio? Uh, like little kids, you know. So we managed to sneak off, and I think for for about two minutes, it was like me, Craddock, Andy, and Ben just sort of stat and pilgrim. I think we start we're just standing in the studio, and there was no one in there. I'm like wow. Um, so many experiences like that. Incredible. I'll never ever forget them. What about the crowds in America? Because there's always talk of like the jam. <laughs> And Paul flying home when he was in America for because um, going underground had gone to number one and him not really giving us stuff about breaking the US. But actually, he's really appreciative of those audiences, it seems to me. And the audiences absolutely love you guys in the States, don't they, on those tours? Yeah. To be in his band, I don't think, I don't know whether you take much notice of all that. You just play the gigs. And if it's a good gig, it's a good gig. And it doesn't really matter where it is, you know. But from what I've, what I saw, they loved him. And the gigs are great. The, pe- yeah, the people are lovely. And there's, you know, there's also a lot of people that travel over to go to those gigs as well. Mm. So it's really special to see people that have come from, you know, England or whatever, and they've come all the way over, or even Australia, you know, to see those gigs. It's quite impressive. No, I loved it. And I think they, I mean, they loved it too. How different is it? Because Japan seems like a completely different experience again, from what I can work out in terms of the crowd. Yeah, Japan is mad. Japan is the biggest culture shock I think anyone could ever have. The gigs are so weird because they're silent before the gig. They're not talking and they're not cheering or anything like that. And you sort of, you walk on to silence it's bizarre. And you sit down, you can sort of hear the air come out of your stool, you know. And after every song, they sort of go, and they'll clap for like 30 seconds and it's just silent. It's so bizarre, but they just, they listen to everything. But they're amazing. The people out there are incredible. I love Japan. It's such a great place to go and, and, and visit. And if you can play, if you're lucky enough to play gigs out there, then yeah, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. I remember watching the video of the um, Sydney Opera House as well, which would have, must have been that tour again. And you did a few nights there, I think, on that. Yeah. We flew from Japan straight to Sydney. We did three nights there. Yeah. And we, we landed on uh, Australia Day. So we were staying right on the harbour. I don't think any of us knew anything about Australia Day until we got there. I remember all this sort of commotion going on. We're like, what's going on here? And then we stood around the harbour and it was the most, ama- I've never seen anything like it. There was like opera singers, fireworks. It was like a full shebang. And it took us like two hours to get back to the hotel. It was like a five minute walk. You know, all these people just came out of nowhere. I loved that experience of going to Sydney. It was amazing. And me and Ben went to the beach and we were swimming in the sea and completely forgot about sharks. We were like, what are we doing? We were floating on our back, you know, Bondi Beach. Like, yes, have a bit of this. We're like, oh yeah, but the sharks. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, as a former radio presenter, I do love, love, love a radio session. And around this time, 2017, a kind revolution would have been promoing. There was a moment with Chris Evans. Chris Evans for me, back in the day, GLR, TFI Friday, Radio 1. One of the big reasons why I wanted to get into radio, he was just brilliant. And you guys were there, Radio 2 at the time, played songs from A Kind Revolution. I remember you guys doing that, and there was a cover you did, which was an Eddie Floyd song. And I wanted to talk, because there's, we'll talk about some more covers in a sec as well, actually, because there's a where well, it was the single last year how do you guys select those cover versions and what to play on those radio sessions does that come from Paul or do you all kind of chip in with ideas or? yeah it normally comes from Paul I think but sometimes we might have done things before and we'll sort of go why don't we do that again because that was really good like I think we did Roadrunner for the third man record release did that again yeah so there's a few ones that sort of come back but he, he normally suggests them and he's just like learn this and most to be honest with you most of the time 
I have to lie and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I love that tune. I've never heard it before in my life, you know. But I just don't want to look like an idiot in front of everybody else. Yeah, I love that song, yeah. And I have to get to go and listen to it and learn it. That's what you get for being fresh legs. And the youngest one, I guess, I sort of try to uh, blag my way through it a bit. Yeah, I know that song. Yeah. That- <laughs> it's one of my favourites. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's on the, um, that was the B-side to one of the, back in the day when we had single releases, um, to Woozy Mama, which was lovely. But there's, then we have to move on to, where is it? We have to move on to this here, which is, I mean, an absolute masterpiece. I'm sure you'll agree. I mean, how cool is that? cover true meanings what an album yeah bloody hell i love the um, colors on that it's just beautiful isn't it and it's i mean you can't yeah. beat the big old vinyl either and again playing on a couple of tracks on that with the songs that i get to play on with paul it's always strange sort of remembering them because it's normally it, it might be like i might play on like a demo and then won't hear it like for like two years and then it will turn into a song and then you have to think like did i play keys on that or did i do that on that so it's really like if you said to me what songs have you played on I'd have to go through it and have a look, you know. There's so many things you just pop it. I literally would sometimes pop in for a cup of tea and go, Tom, can you just stick a little bit of this? And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before I know it, I've been there for like, you know, 10 hours or something and I've had a curry. And that's what I love about the way Paul works really is he's really inclusive. It doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what you've done. If you think she can do something, it'll just let you have a go. But yeah, going back to True Meanings, I just love that album. And I just like it always reminds me of the festival hall gigs that we did, which were just amazing. Playing with the orchestra, Hannah Peel obviously orchestrating it. It's just incredible. What an incredible experience. That was another weird moment. So you walked on stage, it was really quiet, you know. You could hear a pin drop. And I think sometimes when we play gigs, we can sort of go off piste a little bit and, um, you know, we can jam out or whatever we do. I mean, we stick to a structure pretty much, but sometimes Paul might want to go off or on a musical tangent, shall we say. With the orchestra, you can't do that. You can't move anywhere because it's all to, you know, to a score. I don't think any of us can read music, to be fair. So we just go by like the vibe of it. But those gigs, I remember we had to learn everything as it is, note perfect, which was such a challenge, but such an amazing experience because I think we all came out of it better players, really, because we all had to listen more and we were really structured yeah it was great but that's what that album reminds me of is, is those gigs and that time the other aspects album from that gig is something I play all the time it's so special the sound of it is just absolutely beautiful from the orchestra and you yeah. guys playing together it's brilliant um, I can remind you of the songs you're on on, on True Meanings actually so <laughs> Soul Searchers which um uh, Conor O'Brien from Villagers has been on the podcast and talked to us about that because he obviously co-wrote and he's on that as well. Um, Rod Argent from yeah. Zombies, who's going to be on the podcast very soon on Hammond Organ. Um, wow. And you're backing vocals with Maxine. So you mentioned Mark Boxall earlier on. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maxine, did you do them together? Were you side by side or did she get added separately? Do you remember? I think, I think it was added separately. And also the Rod Argent thing, that is not an easy solo to learn, you know. <laughs> that Hammond solo that he does is... Uh, that's one of the songs I remember getting sent and it was like, oh no, I've got to learn that. Um, <laughs> Damn you, Rod. <laughs> yeah, I know. I sort of tried to emulate it the best I could. I was like, I can't, I, know, I can't do that. What would he say when you were backing vocals and Rhodes Piano and then moving on? Which yeah. I, I love that song. It's a beautiful song. But you were backing vocals on that as well. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, see, this is what I mean, though. Those backing vocals might have been done sort of, it'd be just to sort of pop, oh, do you fancy doing a bit of that? Or I might just have an idea, but then you don't hear it again for, for ages and until it comes out. But no, I do. As you're talking about it, of course, I remember doing all of it, especially what would he say? I remember doing that. I think we did that live, I think. I think the roads was just kept, I think. Those kind of stripped down songs, as much as I love all this stuff, and we're going to talk about something next that's kind of really out there. It's like the other extreme of true meanings. Yeah. But I love sometimes that's just that. If you can, you know, a song to me on a, you know, a guy on an acoustic guitar, if it sounds good like that, you kind of go wrong, can you? And that, that's what the album is. And then you add the layers and the textures from Hannah and the, the rest of you. I think it's a real tribute to his songwriting, I think. I think he's really proud of that album because it's there's no you can't hide behind anything on that album. The songs are there and that's what it is. And they stand up, you know, they're fantastic songs. Um, and it is really, it is just a guitar, most of it, and a vocal and strings, you know, yeah, they colour it and stuff, but you can't hide behind any pops and bands, you know, it's it is what it is. And I love those songs. I think Aspects is a beautiful song. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that's still Paul's yeah. favourite. I was looking at the um, they yeah. just released like the, the press release for the new book that's coming out in October. And aspects is if you buy the gel- the big deluxe version of it, aspects the lyrics are there, and, and he, I think he says it's like it's right up there, one of his favourite songs ever. Yeah, I can see why as well. I think it's a beautiful song. The lyric is fantastic. That song and it's great to play as well. It's really a nice moment, really quiet, and everybody listens. And it's kind of like the guitars because I think there's three guitars on it. At the same, like they sort of sat around one mic and recorded them all together, and it's kind of like um, 
the art of weaving, <laughs> like Keith and, uh, and Ronnie talk about in the stones. It's like, you know, nobody gets in the way of anybody else. They fit together nicely, you know? That's like, I always think that's magical with you guys. It's, I don't know if that, does that come just from something natural together rather than loads and loads of practice and getting that right? It just seems that you're, you all click together in, in that band. Yeah, I think it comes from the fact that Paul and Craddock have played together for, I don't know how long, probably nearly 30 years or something. And myself, Ben and Andy have played together before, you know, in the moon. So we kind of had a vibe already. So we, we can kind of know where each other are going to go. It seems to just fit. I don't know. I don't really know why. I can't put my finger on it, but we all get each other. And I'm a massive fan. And I think that helps. And everybody's a fan, you know. So it's not like you're going in to play for a stranger and music that isn't familiar to you and isn't close to you. So you kind of feel part of it a part of the song in a strange way. I think that's why it works, you know. Everyone's got so, such respect for the songs and everybody playing on them, you know. I mentioned that some of Paul's stuff's really out there. The next thing I wanted to mention to or talk to you about was In Another Room. So we haven't yet talked about this on the podcast because <laughs> I don't think anybody else works on it apart from you and Paul. And Charles, yeah. yeah. So this yeah. was a, a release on Ghost Box, which is this brilliant label that's just, you know, really out there in terms of their releases. And I know Paul loves it. But this was limited to just a thousand copies on vinyl. So the point that I've not even got it on vinyl. I have to, I have to, if I'm going to listen to it, I have to listen to it on the old Alexa thing. Yeah. Um, I haven't got it on one. So it's, it's really, where did that project come from and how did you get involved in that? Because it's really different. That is a total coming down for a cup of tea moment, is what that was. I came down and I could hear birds tweeting and I thought, oh, what's going on here? And he kind of explained to me what he was doing. And I sort of sat there for a bit thinking, oh, okay, and it was really far out, man. It was like, and it was getting... The day was getting later and later and it was getting darker and darker and it was echoes and doof, doof and all these birds tweeting. Yeah, it was, I was just there. And I think we just did stuff together. I think I played a bit of drums on it or pr- I did prayer bowl on bits. and Yeah, yeah, you play a prayer bowl. Is that something yeah. that's there anyway? Or is that it next- was sitting is- next to me on the, oh, right. on the filing cabinet. And I was like, should we just try that? And he was like, yeah. Okay. It was one of them ones where you could literally do anything, you know, you could throw anything on it. It was just atmospherical and it was, but it was wicked. I loved doing that. And it was a lovely session. Yeah, I've got some mad demos of that actually because there was like some pre-recorded stuff that we did and I think Walking's on that or like the first part of Walking I think that's where that track came from but yeah I found it the other day actually I've got this CD and it's just I've got three minutes of just footsteps <laughs> <laughs> who's just footsteps? Echo. I think it was Paul I think I was maybe playing the drums and Charles had some mad sort of slap back on it and Paul's just walking around the studio. I don't know what he was doing, just walking around and that is, there's three minutes of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what happened to that, but um, yeah, that was a cool session actually, yeah. And it's like, you learn so much, even with things like that. And maybe some people would walk into that session and think, well, I don't know, this isn't for me, you know. But I love all of that. I love the things that I don't know anything about and I can learn stuff and, you know, play a prayer bowl. Why not? You think Paul's been doing this, what, 45 years in, you know, since the jam now and that first record deal and still wanting to experiment, still wanting to push the boundaries, try new things. I can't think of a single other artist who after that long would still want to be doing those kind of things. It's remarkable, really. It really is. Yeah, I agree. Everything's different. It's always something else going on down there. It's never the same. And it's always exciting. And it makes you want to play. I always come back from the barn and it, it could be doing whatever, whatever style of music. And it will make me want to come home and write, which I think is really inspiring. That's one of the main reasons why I used to go down there all the time. It'd be like, I'd come home and I'd love to just pick my guitar up or sit by the piano and I'd be inspired by his work ethic, really. It's just no stopping him and it would just keep going and going and do any style you like and write whatever way. And I just thought that was amazing. In another room is one of them, you know, it's just him experimenting, finding different styles, and doing what he wants. I think that's a nice luxury that he has, is he just can do pretty much what he wants. And as a writer, that must be so fulfilling um, to have that freedom to go, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do an avant-garde EP or whatever. Yeah, I read that he thought it was around like 22 Dreams. It was a really like, for him, felt like that was like a self-indulgent album. And like, and then everybody loved it. And it's like, okay, do you know what? Fuck it. From now on in, I'm just going to do what I want to do. And if other people like it, and obviously we do. But yeah, yeah that's great, isn't it? And, and we have to talk yeah. about, I mean, obviously the past couple of years have been horrendous with the pandemic and everything for... I mean, so many people, the music industry, everybody, live gigs, uh, you know, all of us affected. But on the plus side, we have had two fabulous number one albums from Mr. Weller in that time. And and three albums, if you count the live one at the tail end of last year as well. So let's talk about On Sunset, because you're there on the opening track, piano and backing vocals for Mirrorball, which again is like a nuts. I mean, what's it, like eight minutes long or something ridiculous? (laughs) It goes up in so many different directions. But uh, I mean, that's a brilliant album again. Mirrorball was... 
I mean, I think it was near, it was pretty much done. I think the first time I kind of heard it, and I just had this little idea for the for the intro, and I think it's kind of like a sort of almost sort of Celtic piano thing. And I was playing it in the live room, and Paul sort of came and said, "Ah, oh, I really like that." So we just stuck it on. Yeah, it was just another time to just be around creative people and see you know Paul's work come together and be able to you know lucky enough to play on some of it it was kind of an escapism thing really because could go down there and just sort of feel a bit free and out of the pandemic for a few hours you know Fat Pop which came last year what from what I read was a different way of working because you were all obviously were all locked down and stuff he was sending each of you different bits and pieces to then send stuff back on was that what happened from your point of view as well on that yeah I mean I don't I didn't record anything at home but I remember everybody else did. I went down and did a few bits at the barn and then towards the end of the album, I did a little bit more, but it's so kind of sporadic. And so it wasn't like one day where I can remember going down there and sort of doing it or, you know, but I remember um, seeing it come together because I would either be sent tracks or, you know, Paul would be like, listen to this and da, da, da. And it's come on so much further than before where, you know, Ben has put some more drums in it or Andy's done some more BVs or Steve's put on some guitars and things like that. And I thought it was amazing that nobody had to be together to do that. Yeah. yeah I, th- I don't know whether that's something that will continue, but um, it was pretty cool to see nothing had to stop, you know, it could carry on and everybody could still create. Yeah, that was great to see that come together. I just imagine like Charles, I mean, practically living at the barn, which I think he does most, I'm right. <laughs> And you get like yeah. people just feeding in all these things. And obviously Pro Tools being such a massive thing now, it's not like you're all working on analog and tape and stuff, which actually up until, I mean, not that long ago that Paul was working that way, but, you know, being able to embrace that technology now has mean that you can, you can do all that kind of stuff, right? It makes it a lot easier. Yeah, of course. I'm quite, you know, I'm surprised that Paul, you know, was happy to do it that way. But I think he's glad he did now because I think we always buzz off each other being in the same room and there's something great about being together and making music. But um, yeah, and for Charles, I think, yeah, he probably was just bombarded with people sending him stuff and he probably didn't even know it was coming in. You know, Paul might have asked someone, can you do that? And he'll just be presented with like a, you know, harmony thing or a drum idea or whatever. But he probably loved it as well, you know, could just be there on his own and got to talk to anyone, has he? Yeah, nice, that's true. Yeah, it doesn't have to come over the house or you lot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. There was one other thing on, um, on Sunset we should talk about, which is a, a track, there's a track called Earthbeat which has, is, again, I think it was the first single got Coltrane on it, um, but the Para Orchestra are on that one as well. And you're there backing vocals with the staves. I'm guessing, again, all separate, right? So you're just coming yeah. and adding some bits when you're down there for a coffee or whatever. And yeah, next time absolutely. you hear it, suddenly everybody else is on it and it's all layered up. That's exactly what it is, yeah. That would have been the same thing. Yeah, I wasn't there for the, for the staves all for when Coltrane did his bit. But that's kind of the nice thing as well, because it just builds and it just evolves into something else. And you don't see it happening. It all happens sort of behind closed doors and it becomes this amazing thing. And then you hear it back. It's like, wow. We should talk 2020 because... I mean, bloody hell, considering we're all in lockdown, a productive year for output, right? So you're on the um, Sunset album. We have in October The Moon's Pocket Melodies, which is... I mean, I think it's the Moon's best album. It's a great piece of work. And yeah. Andy was obviously talking to us on the podcast about that as well. That must have been really nice to have more Moon's material out there in the world as well. Yeah, it was great. I love the Moon's thing because I sort of come and go. I sort of, I'm not like a permanent fixture, you know. And when he said we're going to Abbey Road and recording a live album, I was like, yes, you know, I'm in. And I was like, how long are we going to rehearse for? He's like, uh, probably a day. <laughs> so I think we did. I mean, we did like a day or a couple of days and that's the way it always is with the moons. Be like, oh, we're going to do this gig or we're going to do this tour or whatever. And it's like, well, how long are we rehearsing for? Well, we'll do, we'll do like an afternoon. We haven't played together for like three years. <laughs> But we always try to, we always somehow get it together. I don't really know why, but that was an incredible experience to be able to, I remember walking into Abbey Road and just the smell of it, it like, it just smells of like history, you know? I can't explain it, but it sort of hits you. Yeah, what an amazing place. And great songs as well. It was a great place to record it, not just because of the Beatles thing. Obviously, that's a massive part of it. But the sound of the songs lent themselves to that room, I think. And it was nice to do it with the strings live and to have the the space to do the separation, you know, so it wasn't all just like a massive mess. You could hear everything in the room. That's what I remember. I also remember (laughs) playing the, um, there was a Hammond set up for me. And I think I pressed one note and it blew up, right? The Leslie just didn't work anymore. And the guy was like, oh, I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I was like, have you got another one? He was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the Sergeant Pepper one though. I was like, ah, okay. Press one note. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Maybe I was being told something, you know, someone was like, you should not be in here. You're not worthy. <laughs> but you play, so there's like organ, keys, electric piano. There's like a grand piano on that from you as well, isn't there? Yeah, that was, I think that is the, the piano that the Beatles used to use, I think. Wow. It's an old Steinway. Yeah, there's so many pianos lying around there. There's like the Mrs. Mills one lying around, like Lady Madonna one's there. 
I remember I played that. Yeah, it's like a museum, that place. There's so yeah. much stuff everywhere. Yeah, but that was a really enjoyable album to make, that was. I loved it, and it was really musical, and once again, everybody listening to each other. And we had to get it, you know, we had to get those songs in sort of two takes, I think, because we only had a day there, you know. It must be so sure. nice as well when you see, on all these projects, when you see them kind of go out in the world and the public love them so much, you get such great feedback. All of these albums that we're talking about get such great reviews as well, so the critics love them too. That must be really special to feel like you're part of that and you've had that input. Yeah, definitely. It just makes you realise why you do it, I think, because you do it and then you forget about it and then it comes out and it's like, oh yeah. And it's nice to have that time where you're not listening to it and then you listen to it again when it's out in the world and people are saying such lovely things it's like oh yeah that's why we do this thing you know yeah. that's why we like to love to you know love music and, and the camaraderie of it that's my favourite bit or one of it is just be, I'm lucky enough to play with such amazing musicians and they're all like my best friends you know that's what I think anyway they probably yeah. said different <laughs> yeah Andy's that's not what Andy said at all I'm joking <laughs> I'm joking the, um, <laughs> the also the tail end of 2020 we also had your first solo material as well so high rise two questions one is this something that you're going to be doing more of is there more solo stuff to come and um, he's nodding folks but we'll talk about that in a second and then tell me about that because it was also raise money for Centre Point as well wasn't it yeah I think Claire Moon sort of mentioned Centre Point to me and I thought wow it'd be such a great thing to put this song out because I wasn't that was just a song that I was writing for, for a solo thing and I thought why not put it out and if I can raise a little bit of money then great you know and people seem to like it it was cool me and my girlfriend made a, a, a video which we went around London with our phones and that was a fun thing to do because it was in the pandemic and we couldn't really do anything else so it was just a nice thing to do and I just wanted to do put something out musical and if I could raise a bit of money for charity then great and then Ben Gordini he mixed it played bass on it and drums so yeah that was cool so I just sent it to him and he did his thing sent it back and we just put it out but yeah I'm, I'm working on a, a, a solo thing at the moment I've got about mm, I've got about eight songs together I think that are pretty much done I've recorded some of it down at Craddock's place and it's some stuff at the barn and also I went to um, do you know the band Band of Skulls have you heard of them before yeah yeah. well the singer he lives in South, he's got like a little studio in Southampton and I did some tracks there as well so I kind of put myself around a little bit. I didn't want to do it in one place. I wanted to work with a few different people and just see what happens. And I've got no kind of deadline of when I want to put it out. I just started writing in the pandemic and I was like, I've got to do something, you know, so I'll just write a solo thing. And it's turning out to be quite nice. So I'm going to sit on it for a little bit and maybe write some more songs. And hopefully, I don't know. Yeah, maybe by the end of this year, I'll have something out, I reckon. Okay, cool. Nice. Now we're right on the cusp of the tour that we mentioned at the beginning. So that's a going to rehearsals. But tail end of last year, we had... Back out on the road again after so long. It must have been really special to be back in live audiences and playing as a band again, was it? Yeah, it made me laugh seeing people come through the door at the barn. Just the smiles on their face. It was like, freedom! You know? <laughs> <laughs> It was like the boys are back in the gang, you know. Yeah, it was great. It made me laugh and everyone was coming in. It was like, hello! You know, hugs everywhere. I was like, yes! I think everybody was buzzing. Yeah, great time. Wicked tour. It was a shame that it, you know, finished a couple of gigs early, but I think it was pretty surprised that we got as far as we did as well. Great. One of my favourite tours, actually, I think. And I don't know whether that's because it was so long, like, you know, since we'd played... I think it was just, I think it was every, everyone wanted it. You know, the crowds wanted it and the gigs were amazing. I remember it was the first time I went to the Barrowlands. Wow, you know, that's an experience. Everybody used to say about, well, oh, the Barrowlands, man. Well, that's a fucking proper gig, that is. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't realise until you get there. <laughs> that is so loud. They, at the end of the gap, they stamp their feet at the end, like boom, boom, boom. Great to be back on the bus again and just having a laugh and playing great music. The set list I thought was mega. Yeah, just hanging out and playing with your mates again. That's the best. It's the best yeah. feeling. It was mad because right at the beginning when you started off, there were like 35 songs in that, the actual set list, the, like, the live set list. And it was like, like two and a half hours or something. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. We were mad for it, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was. Yeah, was it like two and a half hours, wasn't it? I think. Yeah. yeah, it was incredible. But it didn't feel like that. I remember everyone would come off. It's like, it felt like five minutes, you know. It went really fast. And I think, um, yeah, just enjoyed it. So I think that's why it was so long is because we just wanted to play, you know, especially Paul. He was buzzing for it. Yeah, it must have been. Um, so I was thinking, trying to figure this out. I think it must have been like the longest period that he hadn't played live for in his career. Yeah, my, yeah, I think it was. Like, no. And were there standout songs for you? So when you were in rehearsals, when you were then you know, doing the talk, were there ones where you, like when you were performing them, you were like, this, this is great. And were there ones where you went, I'm so glad this is part of the set. This is an absolute banger. Yeah, I love playing Brushed. I love playing that. That's so cool to play that. And that pleasure, that was wicked because we sort of did a different version, like a sort of Richie Havensy kind of version of that. And I got to go over and play Paul's piano, which was pretty cool. Just being out and playing music again 
it didn't matter what we were playing. <laughs> Could have played any of it. But obviously the classics as well, you know, getting to play Malice again, that's always a buzz. Changing Man, I love playing that song. I love Still Glides the Stream. That's a really nice song to play. It's a proper moment, that is. Yeah, so many, so many of them. So many of the songs. Above the Clouds. Oh, Yes. It amazed me there's still so, so, I mean, obviously there's so much material. I don't know how you whittle it down. You guys whittle it down to a set list and Paul whittles it down to a set list. But there were still songs that from the latest album and from On Sunset that have yet to have an, a, a, an airing in public. So Fat Pop being one of them. I was like, that's going yeah. to that, be an absolute banger live. And I was like, oh, they've not done it at all. Yeah. Well, you never know. Uh, it might crop up. <laughs> what was the other one I was thinking about? Um, oh, True with the Leah from the Mr. Ins. That's yeah. a great one. But yeah, there's, there are some where you go, there's just too many bloody good songs, right? I guess that's the issue. Yeah, I know. And there's even more songs that don't even make the album. You know, there's songs left over, I think, and things like that that are just might never, you know, might, might never come out. And you're like, how can you not put that out? It's great. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, even on, and even on the deluxe one of Fat Pop, there's a track called Into the Sea, which is beautiful. And you're like, how is that not on the main album? Christ. The amount of material is just, I mean, God knows. But, I, but there'll be some surprises on this new tour then. I know, I'm not going to ask you to name what you're working on, but it's, diff- it's yeah. been a different tour to the last one, right? Yeah, there's always new ones, right? There's always new or new old ones that come up that people will, I'm sure, be excited to hear. That's all, that's all I'm going to say at the no, moment. Fair enough. Tour bus, the last tour. You were on tour the last time around when the, the Get Back Beatles documentary landed on Disney Plus, right? Oh, my God. Have you seen it? Oh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, we watched, we had it on the bus. Incredible. It's like seven hours long. So like every day we would do like to the, the next episode, you know, and uh, it's the quietest the bus has ever been, I think. We sat there for like two hours, two, three hours, whatever it was, and we were just glued to the screen like this. And um, yeah, that talk about getting you buzzed for a gig. There's nothing, that was wicked watching that and then being able to go on and do gigs and stuff. But it made me laugh in sound checks. We'd sort of get there and we'd be jamming out, you know, Beatles songs. <laughs> <laughs> the thing I thought was really interesting as well was it because it's obviously all about the creative process, really, isn't it? It's like you're yeah. not just watching like a final performance. You're seeing these songs evolve over time and stuff. And I guess that's very similar to you guys, I guess, at Black Barn when you're making an album together as well. Yeah, it was not. It was actually pretty amazing to see because you think they're superhuman, you know, the Beatles. You think well, they're just, you know, superheroes. But then they're just normal people that can make good tunes, you know, and it wasn't too much overthinking about it was just really natural and it was like oh that's that is how you're supposed to do it you know there isn't kind of this mad blueprint that they know about that we haven't got yeah they're just good songwriters that do it exactly the same as everybody else yeah so that was nice to see actually it was kind of a bit inspirated but gives you a bit of hope to think well you know we are doing it the right way yeah <laughs> and maybe, uh, you know just got to write another let it be yeah no pressure <laughs> yeah no. i look forward to that solo album <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about 2022 then. And at the time of recording, you're just days away from starting rehearsals, like we mentioned, heading back out on the road very, very soon. But also, most importantly, 26th of January this year, you became a dad for the second time. Is that right? Yes, I did. Yeah, baby Suki. She's in the area, mate. (laughs) <laughs> she's uh, she's definitely a baby. She's very loud. She's crying, but she's all good. I love her to pieces. It's amazing. Yeah, father of two. So little Sienna, who's two now, and uh, and Suki. Yeah, I'm loving it. I absolutely love it, and it's the best thing I ever did. I think. I've be, you know, having children. It's cliche as it sounds, but it changes you. I don't know how, I don't know really why, but it changes you. It changes your whole outlook on life, I think. And it puts it all into perspective. But, you know, getting away for a few weeks, that'll be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you. It's, a, it's, that, yeah, it's that thing of like, yeah, should I say that? Yeah, but you're right, I'm guessing yeah. you're like a bit, bit of a rest to go on tour, right? <laughs> well, yeah, I know. shouldn't say it, but you sort of go to work to have a rest. I'm going to miss them like mad, really. And I think it's sort of five, six weeks I'm going to be away. So that's a long time. Um, but... Yeah, it would be nice as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, this year, obviously, so there's you know a whole, whole big stack of dates. I know the European stuff isn't happening right now, which is a shame, but there's a load of stacks of dates, but also Hot Farm and Chelsea and things like that. So, I mean, God, it's going to be busy with summer, right? Yeah, I can't wait. I think it's near enough for like every weekend in the summer, I think. Well, it looks that way anyway. But I love doing the outdoor gigs with Paul because I remember sort of learning guitar and stuff to the um uh, what's that is it is it high park the dvd i remember um going back to mark his cousin his cousin his cousin lent me an amp a bit like a big marshall amp right and an sg because i didn't have electric guitars like, here you go just play that 
every day after school, man. I used to crank that DVD and just, I blew the amp up in the end. I remember I always went out when he came to pick it up, but there you go, another story. But, um, <laughs> but that, I always remember watching that. And then when we do the outs, outdoor gigs, it's just like, it's like, wow, you know, I'm now in the band and we're playing an outdoor show to all these people. The sun's going down. It's beautiful. And they always seem to be sunny. I don't think I've done a, like a rainy outdoor gig with him. I think I've been lucky. It's always funny. Yeah, I love doing those outdoor ones. It's wicked. One thing we should talk about from last year. Yes, another Weller release. So this was post Fat Pop, Third Man Records, a limited vinyl release, three cover versions. So I've not got the yellow vinyl, I've got the black vinyl, but at least I've got the black vinyl because this thing was like bloody rocking all shit, right? So yeah. this was, what was it, last September, Jack White's record label. And I'm not, I've always wondered if Paul's into Jack White because he's never referenced him in music and stuff. But the fact that he was on his label, you kind of think, well, maybe he must be a bit of a fan and stuff. But Paul chose these, you mentioned Motown earlier, three Motown tracks, I guess linking in with the Detroit bit of Third Man Records and stuff. But so we had, um, what was it, Going to a Go Go, Smokey Robinson, Roadrunner, you mentioned earlier, Junior Walker, and then what does it take? Which I didn't know that song actually until Paul covered it, which again was Junior Walker. I don't know if you were the same. Yeah, Isaac, like I said earlier, I didn't know it. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I actually, like, that's my favourite one on the record, I think. I mean, we did a great version of that, and it's really fun to play. I don't know whether we'll ever get to do it again, but um, yeah, it sounds mega as well. Did you know what um, it was for? Did Paul say what this project was going to be for? At that point, did you yeah. know it was a Jack White thing? Yeah. No, we knew what it was kind of be going to be for. I mean, we just got sent the songs and it was like, we just all went down there, played them and hung out. And it was, uh, it was pretty straightforward, really. But it was cool to be on Jack White. I don't know if Paul's a massive fan, but I am. I love Jack White stuff. And to have something to come out on his label was pretty cool, I think. Mm. Yeah, because the and yellow then, vinyl, you could only get in the shop. So you had to queue up in Soho for hours on end while the shop opened. Yeah. And yeah, at the end of the evening, apparently Jack White came out and played on the balcony or something like Prince back in the day or something. It was, did you ever get a copy of the vinyl? Have you got it? Yeah, I got one of those bad boys. Yeah, I got one of them. But he did. Yeah, he played on the roof, and I think that was um, who's the geezer that put the shark in the tank? Damien Hurst. That's it. Yeah, he played on um, Damien Hurst's balcony, so, which oh, is right. next to the office or above the office. Uh, okay. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I heard anyway. Okay, that's a really cool project. Right, a couple of things we have to do before you go. Um, this has been so lovely. You are allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life. It can be the Jam, the Star Council, or Solo. Which ones are going to be, Tom? Oh. That is a hard one, you know. And I sort of knew you were going to ask me this and I still don't know the answer to it. But I don't know. Um, for me, Changing Man for me has always been one of my favourite tunes. And I remember being in my first band and playing it in the pubs in Woking. And that's always been a, a real, you know, moment. I think that one for his, for his solo stuff, I think Changing Man. But then Brushed, I don't know. I can't, I literally can't answer that because there's too, there's too, there is too many. What does Paul yeah, make of I, you being a Woking man, like a local lad? Don't know, really. We haven't re we don't really speak about it that much, but I think he might like it. I'm just sort of it, another one in Woking that, you know, might have done good sort of thing. Have you been to visit the tree trunks, the, the jam tree trunks? <sighs> I've had the look of them, mate. When I, when I would drove past, <sighs> what is all that about? <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure about that. I think they should put something better than that up there. I mean, the only thing Woken's got going for it is the jam, you know, and Paul. I think they're worth a bit more than three tree trunks. I agree with you. I agree with you. Hey, look, um, final question before you go. So you know the purpose of this podcast, right? So the purpose of this podcast is to talk to amazing people like yourself who've got these connections with Paul and in his band or past, present, and, and who knows, future. Maybe there'll be another T-boy. Who makes the T's at Black Bar now? Is there somebody else kicking around who wants to be in the band in the future? To be fair, Paul's pretty good at making the tea. <laughs> He's always making the tea. Yeah, no, we all chip in. But there was an, actually, there was a guy on the last rehearsal called Ollie, who's an amazing drummer. I can't remember his second name. He was making teas and he was being, and I was like, yes. Oh. I think he's off now playing the drum. He's doing, he's, he's joined another band and he's doing like a proper tour, arena tour with them. Yeah, make tea at Paul Weller Studio and you right. will get a job. Well, I'll be down on Monday. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the purpose of this podcast is not least for people like yourself, but it's also to get that interview with Mr. Weller that I never managed during my radio career. It has to happen at Black Barn. In my head, it's a whole day, but you know, maybe a couple of hours over a cup of tea. Uh, if it happens, what should I ask him, Tom? How do you like your tea? <laughs> How does he like his tea? He likes it. Milk, no sugar. That's it. A nice and strong, no sugars, bit of milk. There you go. If you can do that, I think you'll be all right. Is there anything you'd love to know, but you can't ask him because he's now your mate and you're kind of too close to it and you, as a fan uh, for so long as well? I don't know. 
I'd like to know where he gets his hair cut. I can't ask him that. There you go. <laughs> ah, brilliant. Hey, man, this has been so good. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Good luck with the tour, obviously. Good luck with rehearsals. Oh, it's a all pleasure. That. And um, yeah, cheers, man. I love this. No, oh, thanks, Dan. No worries, mate. My thanks once again to Tom, another amazing guest on the podcast, and good luck to him and the whole Weller crew and band on their upcoming tour. I'll see you in Brighton and at Brixton Academy, guys. Thanks again for listening. A few small asks, if that's okay. Number one, please do subscribe and follow wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, etc. Number two, please share on social media. You can tag me in. It all helps to spread the word to the podcast as well. Feel free to drop the episode into Paul Weller fan forums on Facebook as well. It all helps to spread the word. Number three, if you've enjoyed please buy me a coffee. Head to my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. You'll find all the details on there about my guests so far, previous episodes and blogs, and you can buy me a coffee online as well. Next on the podcast, a really big episode recorded live at the Cockpit Theatre in London. Gary Crowley is my very special guest on the next podcast. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.